In this lesson, we'll take a look at some uh, current research on consciousness and how brains produce conscious experiences. Uh, we'll follow some of the research of Stanislaw Dehaene and his team as they use uh, simple experimental procedures to try to investigate what is happening differently in a brain when we achieve consciousness of something versus unconscious processing of that same stimulus. He's going to define consciousness fairly straightforwardly that if the subject can report the stimulus, you know, they can say they saw it or heard it or something, then they were conscious of the stimulus. If they can't report it, not conscious. Dehane's going to use a masking procedure. And here is a sort of a verbal description of the procedure. I'm going to use a diagram. The subject sits in front of a screen, and on the screen will appear words. Now, if the word is on the screen for at least 30 milliseconds, uh, the subject can report seeing the words. They can be conscious of the word tree. However, interestingly, if right after the word disappears, within a window of about 50 milliseconds, another string of letters or characters appears, and we're going to call that a mask, patients in, or subjects in this condition report that they do not see the word tree. Even though the word tree was presented to them for 30 milliseconds, and they were conscious of it when there was nothing here following the word tree, if a mask follows the word tree within this window of 50 milliseconds, um, they lose the conscious perception of the word tree. So the mask is interfering with the word tree uh, emerging into consciousness. This is sometimes called backward masking because the mask is being presented after the stimulus. So this situation where uh, one condition, we have a conscious, you know, uh, reporting of the word tree, and another uh, unconscious, even though the brain also was exposed to the word tree, it sets up a nice contrast to look at what's happening in the brain. What are the brain differences between these two conditions? And whatever those differences are, uh, the inference is they are related to this idea of generating a conscious experience. Now, before we see some of the, uh, the brain recording data, let's just remind ourselves about some of the... Uh, processing going on. We have visual cortex back here. You've got edge detecting cells back here. And a word, the word tree really, is just a bunch of edges at certain orientations. And visual cortex cells here send information further along the visual pathway. There's an area of the brain down here we're going to call the visual word form area, where we might have memories of different uh, words and the, the visual form of different words. And so if a word on a screen, if that pattern of activity here uh, is similar to some stored memory of, of a word, we'll be in a position to recognize that word. Of course, we have other language areas in the uh, left hemisphere. We have uh, Wernicke's area. The sounds of words are stored in this region, and meanings of words are accessed around here. And we have up in the frontal lobe uh, Broca's area that would have some of the motor programs to say a word. And uh, for most people, these language areas are localized in the left hemisphere. So when we look at the brain recording data, we'll want to know a little bit about some of these language areas in the brain. First up is an, uh, a functional uh, MRI study, functional magnetic resonance imaging. And this technique uh, records changes in blood flow, localized blood, blood flow, which uh, reflects uh, the activity level of nearby neurons. So when a brain region becomes active, it recruits a greater amount of blood flow, and the fMRI uh, scanning technique measures changes in blood flow to different regions of the brain. Now, let's look at the simple contrast. When the word tree is consciously perceived, right, the person reports that they saw it, we get visual cortex activity, but we also get this widespread activity up in the, the frontal cortex and parietal cortex. Notice the difference, then, when there is a mask uh, within 50 milliseconds of the word tree. You do get some visual cortex activity, so the visual cortex appears to be processing the word tree, but what you don't get is the spreading activation up in the frontal cortex and parietal cortex. So right away, just using a simple uh, contrast like this, we can see that uh, what, what seems to be required for a conscious perception is not only that the visual system is uh, processing the stimulus, but that that information is going to spread to other important parts of the brain. And that's correlated to a conscious perception of the word. And if that spreading doesn't happen, uh, we remain unconscious of the word. Presumably, the mask is preventing the spreading activation, and so we report that we don't see the word tree.
Now here's the same basic experiment, but using a different brain recording technique. This is an EEG kind of technique, electroencephalogram, where you have a whole bunch of scalp electrodes. And each electrode is measuring the activity of populations of cells right underneath it on the surface of the cortex. And this te technique is useful for studying the precise timing of events in the brain. It's not as good at, at localizing uh, what's happening where in the brain, uh, but the timing information is fairly good. So let's take a look for the visible word. So the word tree flashes on the screen and the, and the subject uh, reports that they can see it. Well, we get early on, we have activity in the visual cortex, not surprisingly, right? About 150 milliseconds. At about a quarter second, that activity has spread to the frontal cortex and then about half a second back to the back part of the brain, the parietal cortex. And you'll recall, those are the, the same kinds of areas that we saw in, uh, in the functional uh, magnetic re resonance imaging uh, data. We've got frontal cortex activity and parietal cortex activity. Now, notice over here for the masked word, so again, the word tree followed by some string of characters within the 50 millisecond window. We have early uh, activity in the visual cortex, so the brain seems to be processing the word tree here uh, for some uh, amount of time. However, you don't see that big spreading activation towards the frontal cortex and then subsequently towards the parietal cortex. So again, the, the masking condition seems to be preventing this spread of activity from the visual system to other parts of the brain, cor frontal cortex and parietal cortex, that seem to be correlated with a conscious perception of the word tree. Now let's try to understand what's happening in the brain at different regions uh, that uh, the EEG and the fMRI techniques were uncovering. So here we have our brain and the little dots would be like the position of the scalp electrodes. And you'll recall that when the word tree is flashed on the screen, we get the first kind of uh, increase in activity in the back of the brain, the visual system, right? So it turns out that with the EEG uh, technique, you can measure fairly precise times of events. It takes about 60 milliseconds for the tree on the computer screen to reach back to the back of the brain here. And remember, we have edge detectors back here. So 60 milliseconds it takes for action potentials to race down the optic nerve to the thalamus, synapse in the thalamus, thalamus cells, and action potentials up to visual cortex. Edge detectors, a certain population of edge detectors will respond to the word tree and send their information further along the visual uh, recognition pathway. The visual word form area here is, is a kind of a, a place where we would have memories of uh, the forms of word, the visual forms of words. And so the current pattern of activity here can reactivate a, uh, a previous memory, and this would be uh, the beginning stages of recognizing the word tree. Now let's follow along what happens here during the conscious uh, presentation of the word, and then we'll see how the mask might uh, uh, interfere in some kind of way. What Dehane argues is that uh, the visual word form area here can then send uh, information about the word tree up to other areas of the brain, like where we would have the memory of the sound of the word tree, or the meaning of the tree. In addition, the word form area can send feedback signals back to earlier stages of visual cortex and set up reverberating loops of activity. And all of this uh, processing happens within a quarter second. So for Dehane, he argues that, uh, that what the brain is doing for the conscious and the unconscious uh, uh, condition is, uh, is fairly similar. So the, the brain activity is going to look similar for the conscious um, condition and the unconscious condition for the first quarter of a millisecond or a quarter of a second. However, if the word tree is going to emerge into consciousness, we get this spreading activation. So here we have the visual system. The information about the tree is going to spread up into the frontal cortex, and we can think of this as entering the working memory system, uh, and in addition to parietal cortex area. And so this whole idea of a wave of activity, spreading activity, um, is correlated to becoming conscious of the word tree. And uh, notice again, remember the working memory system, we said that there, there's going to be some overlap, right, in our understanding of the contents of working memory also tend to be the contents of our consciousness. And so it is critical if we're going to become conscious of the word tree that it enters into this working memory system. And in addition, we have these other uh, long-range communications between frontal cortex and parietal cortex that is correlated to becoming conscious. So.
The hypothesis, the hypothesis for Tahane's group is that reverberating loops that spread across the frontal and parietal cortex are necessary for consciousness. Not only do we have reverberating loops within the visual cortex, we have loops uh, with the frontal cortex and with the parietal cortex. Loops of activity uh, emerge uh, and we become conscious. Therefore, then, the conditions for consciousness are not present if the mask blocks reverberating feedback si signals and prevents the spread of activation to other cortical regions. So we might show that in this diagram here. You'll recall the word tree uh, first hits the visual cortex and is being processed now. But notice there's going to be some feedback here. And, and what if in the feedback, right, so the word form area is sending feedback about the word tree. What if just as those feedback signals are arriving at, at earlier stages of visual cortex, the mask now appears. The mask is going to activate at different populations of cortical cells, and so you're going to prevent a kind of a, a reverberating loop of activity here. Well, that, that mask then may be preventing the spread of activation that we saw for the condition of consciousness. You need to have the spreading activation, and the suggestion is the mask is preventing uh, the conditions necessary for establishing uh, strong loops of activity that then, then can spread to other parts of the brain. So, the EEG data suggests that um, the mask is interfering with this spreading activation. The fMRI data suggests that the mask is interfering with the spreading uh, activation. And so we in, uh, come to the initial conclusion that for the stimulus, for the word tree to become conscious, uh, the visual perceptual regions have to be able to communicate and set up um, uh, loops of activity with important frontal cortex and parietal cortex systems in the brain.